Sinatra song, <laughs> written by Paul Anker, uh, sung by uh, Frank Sinatra, yeah, My Way, and it's a, a kind of anthem of uh, self-confidence. You know? Through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up, I spat it out. It's kind of, I did it my way. So, uh, confidence is uh, definitely a part of the Buddhist path, uh, having uh, faith, having confidence and uh, resolution, these are all aspects of it. But uh, any of us who have uh, uh, spent much time in life trying to follow that uh, uh, say, voice of self-assurance and just, well, even though there's resistance or there's difficult, I'm just going to keep pushing. I'm going to just do it my way. And, uh, or when we are living in community or working with other people and we're in a role of leadership, uh, you know, we can see that um, when you uh, adopt the attitude of my way or the highway, as they say, like either you do it like I want it or on your bike, as they say, that uh, yeah, you're, you're kicked out. That uh, leads to stress and difficulty and conflict. So reflecting on this theme, my way or the middle way, that uh, yes, there are certainly um, beneficial aspects to that quality of self-confidence, self-assurance, and uh, uh, the quality of, of resolution. But if that is out of balance, if that is uh, wrapped up with, uh, as we'd say in Buddhist um, uh, philosophy, it's, it's wrapped up uh, in the qualities of self-view, self-centered thinking, then necessarily the result is going to be painful. You might get what you wanted, but then uh, there might be a lot of wreckage, yeah. a lot of damage created uh, along the way. And uh, probably uh, most of us here have had that situation in life where we come to the conclusion, well, I got what I wanted, but was it really worth it? Or like, oh, I didn't realize it was going to be like this. Or I thought this was going to make me happier. You know, I got what I wanted, but... Yeah. So uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, so these reflections and what will be useful for us to, to look at. I felt that uh, it's um, good to consider the whole way that we, uh, we work in life, how we relate to, to doing, to acting, to choosing, <coughs> how intentions and actions work together. So when we, we sort of, uh, take confidence from uh, Frank Sinatra, say, yes, I'm going to do it my way. Um, then uh, if we take that approach in life, again, I don't uh, have the ability to read anybody's minds, but just the, the way most of our lives function. When we act from a place of, of self-assertion and just keep pushing and uh, uh, say, um, uh, working with our uh, occupation, working with our family, working with the rest of the traffic on the road, working with our minds in a meditation hall, if we have that uh, contentious, self-assertive attitude, I'm going to just make this happen, I'm going to get jhana, I'm going to break through, I'm gonna, I've got this 10-day retreat and this is soda pana or bust. You know, stream entry or, uh, or uh, I'm going to ask my money back. So when we have that uh, self-assertive and... Uh, um, 
contentious attitude, when that's wrapped up with self-view, then any kind of work, I would suggest, becomes uh, exhausting. The, uh, uh, even if it's the work of uh, training your mind to be, to be peaceful. You know, how many of us have noticed that the most peaceful moment of the meditation is when the bell goes at the end? <sighs> Finally I can relax. <laughs> And it's not always just because the, your knees have been released from their prison. But uh, if you notice, it's, it's almost universal. When the bell goes, there's a, this sense of, ah. Isn't that curious? Isn't that curious? Because uh, when the bell goes, I don't have to do something. I don't have to do something. Ah. So there's a, a, a letting go of I-ness, a letting go of, of having, and a letting go of, of doing. That in that moment of the bell going, <sighs> those uh, particular aspects of, uh, of self, uh, self-identity, of ownership, and, and uh, personal uh, action are all emptied out. At least for the time it takes for the bell to be rough, <laughs> before we get on to the next thing. So. Uh, this is important to look at. It's the, what I like to call the, the thank God it's Friday mentality. You know, waiting for it all to be over. Oh, when, when, the, when this meditation's over, then. Or when this retreat's over, then. Or when the week's over, then. Or when I'm retired, then. Uh, and we, we uh, kind of pursue peace and, and uh, contentment, happiness, like the pursuing the horizon, which, lo and behold, keeps retreating. Yeah, you can't walk to get to the horizon, because no matter how far you walk, the, the, high, the horizon always retreats. Yeah, it's always, oh, another, another hill, another layer, another, uh, another distance. But, so this is a very common habit. Again, I'm not reading anybody's mind. You might, uh, but this is what our, our conditioned thinking does. The way that we, we pick up action and choice and, and work is that we, we create this kind of, uh, oh, this is a chore, this is difficult, or, you know, if, if I didn't have to do this, then everything would be fine. If I didn't have to deal with my children, it would be fine. If I didn't have to deal with this job, if only it was the weekend, if only it was my holiday, if only it was on the retreat, if only the retreat was over. <laughs> you know, if only I could become a nun, if only I could become a monk, and then, if I could become a senior monk. If only I wasn't a monk anymore. <laughs> then, and then, and then, and then, and then. But it's the same mentality, whether it's just working in a, a grim job, waiting for Friday, or you know, trying to get into the monastic life, or out of the monastic life, or longing for the retreat to begin, or longing for the retreat to, to end. It's the same condition, I would suggest. Uh, it's just the, um, the mind um, picking up action uh, from a, in, in a, a self-centered way. Like me doing and uh, and uh, meanness, doingness and uh, and thingness, and the, and the sense of compulsion. I have to. I should. So it, the, the the theme of the of this talk is also kind of uh, contained within this famous soliloquy from Hamlet. Hamlet's uh, probably one of the most, uh, if not the most famous passage from Shakespeare. It's where Hamlet he's discovered that. Uh, his uncle has probably killed his father and has um, uh, married his mother and uh, he's wondering what to do or should he do something he's uh, he's pretty sure that uh, his evil uncle has uh, <coughs> done done his fa- his good father to death and then uh, cruelly um, seduced and married his his mother and uh, he's pretty sure this is what's happened but uh, he's wondering what to do. So he, there's this soliloquy, this, this solo speech that he does, where he says, and this is in Shakespearean English, so even though English is not the first language of most people here, uh, it's probably familiar enough. But what he says is, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. So, is it better to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, just to let life dump on you, to be numb, to be passive, just to let it happen, to do nothing? 
Or is it better to take arms against the sea of troubles, to rise up and, and contend, to, <coughs> to attack, to, to take action? And so this is his dilemma. So I hope you can follow that clearly enough. To, uh, to be numb and passive and to kind of do nothing, or to take action and to uh, contend against the way things are. Uh, what's, what's the right thing to do? So, uh, in, a, in a way, I suspect that Shakespeare realized that, and he put those words into Hamlet's mouth, because the point is that neither of them are correct. <laughs> uh, and certainly from the Buddhist perspective, neither of them uh, are, are correct, because they're both, uh, they, they're creating the, um, the polarity of me doing nothing, or uh, me uh, contending against the way things are. So me being passive in relationship to the way things are, or me contending against the way things are. But the middle way is something else. The middle way, I would, I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. I would suggest that the middle way is essentially learning how to work with the way things are. So you're not just being passive, and not being uh, contentious, but learning how to work with the way things are, and to work from a place of selflessness. So uh, when we, we look at that kind of habit of, um, of doing that, I, I hope I'm not presuming too much, but certainly my experience is that the more that there is me trying to do something, even if it's me trying to do something very wholesome, very noble, very useful, um, it does create this kind of burdenness, a stressfulness uh, in the heart. And so that um, we might think, oh, this, this work is too, too difficult, I need to, ret I need to quit. Or this uh, meditation is making me stressed, you know, I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm suffering a lot, maybe I should just stop meditating. <laughs> yeah. So that uh, instead of um, trying to follow my way and sort of push and get things to go uh, the way that we would like to just, uh, uh, say, force things to a conclusion that we want, that the, we instead go drift to the other extreme in Hamlet's soliloquy, that of being passive, to just go numb, to, to, to quote unquote, uh, give up or switch off or to, to, uh, to try to not engage. And so this is, uh, again, often where we get sort of stressed and, and burdened by life, then the way we get away from that is we switch off by consuming alcohol or drugs or uh, distracting the mind, to, essentially to, to not feel. So uh, I used to, before I was a monk, I drank a lot. And I came to the conclusion um, that while I was drinking, uh, and I, I had a kind of epiphany here in Hemel Hempstead at a friend's 21st birthday party. It's my first visit to Hemel. Little did I realize that, <laughs> that was in 1977, I think. So little did I realize that eight years later I'd be moving here in, uh, as a Buddhist monk. <laughs> but anyway, it's another story. But I realized by the time I was 20 that the reason why I was drinking so much was to not feel. I just wanted to switch off. And that was the, the, kind of the only way I could, I could uh, deal with just feelings of insecurity and frustration and uh, um, uh, basic uh, disconnection, was to try and blot it all out. But when I was about an inch uh, from the bottom of a bottle of Teacher's Highland Cream whiskey, having consumed the first seven or eight inches, I came to the conclusion, it's not working. I can't drink enough to get to the place where I feel good. I can't. It won't go numb. And so, uh, and so actually I had the, the thought at the time, this is a waste of good scotch. <laughs> But then it was, it was quite, even though I was obviously a little bit blurry, um, having drunk a pint of scotch, uh, it was quite an insightful moment because it was really clear that I'm just trying to, to not feel, I'm trying to, to switch off, and, and this is not the way to go. So my 21st birthday present to myself was to stop drinking, <coughs> to sort of deliberately turn in the other direction. And to say, okay, well that's not working. <laughs> So numbing is not working, so let's, let's try something else. Uh, I don't know how, uh, again, I can't read anybody's minds, I don't know your life stories, but I would suspect, just by the law of averages, that a few of us in this hall have also tried that 
dealing with life's difficulties by just trying to switch off, just to be distracted, to, to not feel, to, to forget, uh, as, they, as they say. And so, you know, I believe that's uh, in the French culture, that's uh, one of the reasons given why it's probably a few French people here, pour louer, to forget. That's uh, the, you want to, to lose yourself in the, in the, the drink or the, the drugs to, to forget. But uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> and so this is why the, the Buddha's uh, path to the end of suffering doesn't involve um, barbiturates or morphine or alcohol. But, uh, because it doesn't work. This is not the way that we end suffering. And any of us who've been addicted to things and then come off them, you realize that, that the numbing that happens while one is, say, taking a medication or a distraction of some kind, when you haven't got your, a supply of your drug of choice, it's even worse than it ever was before. You know, if you've ever been with someone, a recovering heroin addict or a recovering alcoholic, then it's, uh, uh, it's, life is even more tender, even more painful, even more suffering than, than before the person had started to use that particular kind of escape. So, um, the, so we have on these t the, the two horns of this dilemma that uh, if you try to contend against uh, the way things are and just force it to be, go your way, you end up feeling burdened and stressed and frustrated. And if you try to just switch off and not feel, that doesn't work either. So this is why the Buddha taught what we call the, the, the middle way. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the different path that is not just sort of half, uh, half a kind of uh, uh, obsessive and active and half numb and drunk. <laughs> but many of us have lived our lives that way. Probably if you're gathering for a Sunday afternoon in Amravati, you uh, have uh, already decided there must be a different way. So the middle way that the, the Buddha's path points to is, um, uh, is a, a, a whole different perspective. Because if, if you notice the, the dilemma that Hamlet was in, uh, it's very much based around self-view. Uh, should I do something? Should I do nothing? What should I do? And that, what's the, what's the right thing for me to do? I should push, or I should, st I should do nothing. So the, the Buddha uh, had the approach of turning the attention back onto the, the so-called doer. Turning the attention back onto the attitude with which uh, the heart engages in any kind of, of activity. Uh, I would suggest that uh, we are alive, so we are in a, a process of work. We are living, we are feeling, we are engaged with the world. In a sense, we can't not work. You know, our, our, our bodies, our minds uh, function in such a way as that we, we have to feed ourselves, we have to protect ourselves from the weather, we have to look after ourselves to some degree. So uh, we, we are uh, required by the laws of nature to engage. So the, uh, the, the approach that the, that the, the Buddha takes is a, um, uh, it's kind of hinges around the different usages of the word desire. And so uh, probably a, a number of you are very familiar with uh, this uh, as an aspect of Dhamma teaching. Maybe some of you are, are not. But in, in uh, Buddha Dhamma, you have two distinct words that we would translate as desire. So the first is tanha, which literally means thirst. So uh, the Sanskrit for that is Trishna. So that is uh, what would probably be better translated into English as craving. So Tanha always has a, an agitated, self-centered quality to it. So when the Buddha talks about the cause of Dukkha in the Four Noble Truths, the, the cause, the, the, the root cause of dissatisfaction and discontent um, is Tanha. And it can be... Uh, the craving for sense pleasure, called karma tanha, karma tanha. It can be the craving to become, like a, say, becoming successful, becoming approved of, uh, becoming uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, loved and appreciated. You know, that, uh, that sense of uh, identified being, it's called bhava tanha, the desire to be something, someone. And then it's opposite, vibhava tanha, the desire to to not feel, to not be, to switch off. Uh, 
These are all kinds of tanha, so these are all aspects of craving. They're, so these are the kinds of desire that necessarily will cause dissatisfaction. That's the, that the cause of the spiritual malaise that the Buddha's teaching uh, seeks to cure. That's the, 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 the desire that is the root of dukkha and is resolved by the, the Eightfold Path. So the other kind of desire is called chanda. Uh, so tanha is T-A-N with a dot underneath, H-A with a line over the top, tanha. tanha. And then uh, <coughs> chanda is C-H-A-N-D-A, chanda. So chanda is, um, can be translated as desire, it can be translated as uh, interest, enthusiasm, uh, it can be uh, translated as zeal. So it's in a way the mind's energy that it, uh, or the mind's motivation to direct its energy towards a particular object. So chanda can be unwholesome, right? you know, it can be something that's unskillful, like, like karma chanda, like uh, the desire for sense pleasure. Uh, but it also can be extremely wholesome, like dhamma chanda, the desire for uh, reality. Or, uh, and so that the, uh, these two kinds of desire, in, in English the word desire works for both of them, but they are uh, they're very, very different qualities. So I thought I would share with you a uh, couple of passages. Um, one from the suttas and one from Ajahn Chah, uh, where exactly this is talked about. Because the, uh, when the Buddha speaks of, uh, in his teaching, he talks about Chanda, it's like, uh, not is it just useful, it's a necessary condition for liberation. It's a sine qua non of liberation. If you don't have chanda, there's no way that you can free your heart from greed, hatred, and delusion. Spiritual development is impossible without that kind of desire. So that, um, that's why it's, it's kind of tricky. <laughs> so, which kind of desire do I want? Do I want the apple or do I want the Samsung? You know, which, uh, <laughs> I've got to choose the right brand here. <clears throat> yeah, and so that uh, it's important to look at the specs. <laughs> so that these two passages. So the first one is from the Sangita Nikaya, and it's a dialogue between Ananda, the Buddha's um, attendant and one of his chief disciples, the Venerable Ananda, and um, a Brahmin called Unabha. And it took place in uh, Kosambi, in the um, in uh, on the river Yam. What's now the river Yamuna? Thus have I heard. On one occasion, Venerable Ananda was dwelling at Kosambi in Gosita's park. Then the Brahmin, Unnava, approached the Venerable Ananda and exchanged greetings with him. When they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, he sat down to one side and said to the Venerable Ananda, For what purpose, Master Ananda, is the holy life lived under the ascetic Gautama? It is for the sake of abandoning desire, Brahmin, that the holy life is lived under the Blessed One. But, Master Ananda, is there a path? Is there a way for the abandoning of this desire? There is a path, Brahmin. There is a way for the abandoning of this desire. But, Master Ananda, what is the path? What is the way for the abandoning of this desire? So, it's all very formalized dialogue. <laughs> but, Master Ananda, what is the path? Here, Brahmin, a bhikkhu develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to desire and volitional, formation, volitional formations of striving. He develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to energy, concentration due to mind, concentration uh, due to investigation, and volitional formations of striving. This Brahmin is the path, this is the way for the abandoning of this desire. Such being the case, Master Ananda, the situation is interminable, not terminable. It is impossible that one can abandon desire by means of desire itself. So the Ananda lists these four qualities, uh, Chanda, desire, interest, zeal, Virya, energy or persistence, Chitta, consideration, examination, planning, and Vimaksa, investigation, review, and reflection on results. So, but and now we're saying, but hang on a minute, how can you get to the end of desire by using desire? This is a circular argument. It's, it's, it's interminable, not terminable. I, I also understand that even for people for whom English is our first language, you know, 
think words like terminable are not sort of everyday speech that you, uh, you, you know, we chat with, or volitional formations of striving, these are also kind of quirky <laughs> terms, but uh, hopefully I'll explain the, uh, the, the essences of it. So then the Venerable Ananda responds, he says, well then Brahmin, I will question you about this matter, answer as you see fit. What do you think, Brahmin? Did you earlier have the desire, Chanda, I will go to the park, I go see this park, where the monastery is. And after you went to the park, did the corresponding desire subside? Yes, sir. Did you earlier arouse the energy, thinking, I will go to the park, and after you went to the park, did the corresponding energy subside? Yes, sir. Did you earlier make up your mind, Chitta, I will go to the park, and after you went to the park, did the corresponding resolution subside? Yes, sir. Did you, uh, did you earlier make an investigation? Vimaksa, shall I go to the park? And after you went to the park, did the corresponding investigation subside? Yes, sir. It's exactly the same, Brahmin, with a bhikkhu who's an arahant, whose taints are destroyed, who has lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden and reached his own goal. Actually destroyed the fetters of existence and is completely liberated through final knowledge. He earlier had the desire for the attainment of arahantship, and when he attained arahantship, the corresponding desire subsided. He earlier had aroused energy for the attainment of arahantship. When he attained arahantship, the corresponding energy subsided. He earlier had made up his mind to attain arahantship, and when he attained arahantship, the corresponding resolution subsided. He earlier made an investigation for the attainment of arahantship, and when he attained arahantship, the corresponding investigation subsided. What do you think, Brahmin? Such being the case, is the situation terminable or interminable. Surely, Master Ananda, such being the case, the situation is terminable, not interminable. Magnificent, Master Ananda, magnificent. From today, let Master Ananda remember me as a lay follower who has gone for refuge for life. So, to bring that home, okay, all of you had the desire, except for those of us who live here, I will go to Amravati uh, today to listen to the uh, Sunday afternoon talk. Once you had arrived here, you didn't need that desire anymore because you'd arrived it. Now that you're here, how many of you are thinking, I must go to Amravati? <laughs> it's not there because you're here. The thought is gone. So it was useful to serve that purpose, but now its, it's purpose has been fulfilled, so the thought is gone. And uh, anyway, so uh, to quote Ajahn Chah, he covers the same sort of uh, area in a, a similar vein. So this is Ajahn Chah giving a dumb talk. Why is the practice so difficult and arduous? Because of desires. As soon as we sit down to meditate, we want to become peaceful. If we didn't want to find peace, we wouldn't sit. We wouldn't practice. As soon as we sit down, we want peace to be right there. But wanting the mind to be calm makes for confusion, and we feel restless. This is how it goes. So the Buddha says, don't speak out of desire, don't sit out of desire, don't walk out of desire. Whatever you do, don't do it with desire. Desiring means wanting. If you don't want to do something, you won't do it. If our practice reaches this point, we can get quite discouraged. How can we practice? As soon as we sit down, there is desire in the mind. It's because of this that the body and mind are difficult to observe. If they are not the self, nor belonging to self, then who do they belong to? Because it's difficult to resolve these things, we must rely on wisdom. The Buddha says we must practice with letting go. But if we let go, then we just don't practice, right? Because we've let go. <sighs> so is that supposed to be confusing and frustrating? <laughs> if you're feeling confused and frustrated by hearing that, you're right on the bar. <laughs> so then he goes on to explain. And this, this took place in northeast Thailand, so... Uh, uh, you can translate it into your own uh, yeah, uh, of a mo uh, more local and modern day uh, example. So Ajahn Chah asks, suppose we went to buy some coconuts in the market, and while we were carrying them back, someone asked, what did you buy those coconuts for? I bought them to eat. Are you going to eat the shells as well? No. I don't believe you. If you're not going to eat the shells, then why did you buy them also? Well, what do you say? How are you going to answer their question? If we practice with desire, sorry, how are you going to answer their question? We practice with desire. 
If we didn't have desire, we wouldn't practice. Practicing with desire is tanha. Contemplating in this way can give rise to wisdom, you know. For example, these coconuts. Are you going to eat the shells as well? Of course not. Then why do you take them? Because the time hasn't yet come for you to throw them away. They're useful for wrapping up the coconut in. If after eating the coconut, you throw the shells away, there's no problem. Our practice is like this. The Buddha said, don't act on desire, don't speak from desire, don't eat with desire. Standing, walking, sitting, or reclining, whatever you do, don't do it with desire. This means to do it with detachment. It's just like buying the coconuts from the market. We're not going to eat the shells, but it's not yet time to throw them away. We keep them first. This is how the practice is. Concept, samuti, and transcendence, vimuti, are coexistent. Just like a coconut. The flesh, the husk, and the shell are all together. When we buy a coconut, we buy the whole lot. If somebody wants to accuse us of eating coconut shells, that's their business. <laughs> we know what we're doing. Wisdom is something each of us finds for oneself. To see it, we must go neither fast nor slow. What should we do? Go to where there is neither fast nor slow. Going fast or slow is not the way. So that's from Lumpur uh, Chah's collected teachings. So these uh, different kinds of, of uh, desiring, so that on the one hand, chanda, so there's four qualities, they're called the four idipada, or the four bases of success. So in that example, Ananda uses them to describe going to the park. So they can be used to describe a, a kind of a mundane activity. They can be described, used to describe uh, spiritual development, like you have to, to uh, want to, uh, to realize enlightenment. You have to put forth the energy in order to... Uh, to uh, s uh, reduce greed, hatred, and delusion, and to increase uh, virtue, concentration, and wisdom. Uh, you have to think about what you're doing, chitta, you have to consider, okay, uh, is this working, is this not working, is this, are my efforts heading in the right direction? And then vimansa, that reflection or reviewing means, okay, did I, did I get to Amarati? Did I get to the park? You know, did I, uh, has the mind arrived at peacefulness? So there's that kind of reviewing. So that can be for, um, spiritual realization. It can also be for robbing a bank. You have to think about you know, whether you want to rob a bank or not. Uh, and then think about um, uh, whether you've got the energy and the, uh, as well as the interest to do that. You've got to apply yourself. I'm not encouraging anybody to rob any banks. <laughs> Just using a random unwholesome example. So that uh, you've got to have the interest to do it, you've got to apply the energy to do it, you've got to think about, oh, how am I going to rob the bank? Well, you know, going in with a gun, you know, so kind of 20th, 20th century, you know, maybe I can learn to be a computer hacker, and I'll just, you know, hack a few accounts and rob a bank that way. And then the answer, okay, uh, did, did the bank get successfully robbed? Did I get away with it? Did I not get away with it? Yeah, what's the result? So those four qualities, chanda, virya, jitta, vimansa, that's uh, interest, energy, uh, reflection, uh, so, uh, consideration, and then review. Uh, but they're, they are kind of amoral, they're, they're morally neutral. They can be applied for things that are neutral, things that are, are very uh, virtuous and moral, or, or things that are very immoral. You know, that, that they, they apply for any kind of task we want to undertake. So that um, the more that our interest and energy and uh, reflection and so forth is divested of self-view, the more that, uh, that, that interest and energy and so forth is based on mindfulness and wisdom, then the more that the inclination is going to be to uh, be putting forth our efforts into things that are beneficial for ourselves and others, uh, that are wholesome, that are noble, and uh, the, the more that it's going to be a peaceful process. The, um, in the, the Buddha's descriptions of uh, the Eightfold Path, one of the elements of the Eightfold Path is right effort. So, and the, uh, you have uh, many statements of the Buddha where he says, my path is a path of action, it's a path of doing, it's not a, a path of, of passivity. So uh, that uh, aspect of taking action, giving direction to the mind, you know, working with the mind, is a very strong part of the, the Buddha's path. So when we look at right effort, then it's a, uh, there's a, a, a very clear um, uh, schema that the Buddha lays out. 
uh, a very helpful format you know, how to bring about this kind of wholesome development. So that when we want to be, uh, say, basing our actions on, on chanda, on, the, on the, the wholesome kind of desiring and, and uh, interest, then the more that that, that can be based, uh, uh, say, on mindfulness and wisdom, and the less it's based on self-view, the more it's going to lead to peace. So within the Eightfold Path, you have uh, the aspect of right effort, which again has four aspects. You won't be tested on all of this, <laughs> other than by your own minds. <laughs> you don't have to memorize all of this. But, <clears throat> so the four aspects of right effort are uh, to restrain the unwholesome from arising. So to, say, uh, to have the intention and to work at not allowing greed or anger or selfishness uh, 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 jealousy and, and so forth to arise, to restrain the unwholesome from arising. If the unwholesome has arisen, if you're already feeling a sense of anger or irritation or fear or jealousy, greed, yeah, craving, uh, if that unwholesome has arisen, to let it go. Uh, the third part of right effort is to cultivate the wholesome, to cultivate concentration, loving kindness, uh, wisdom, compassion, and so forth. And then uh, the fourth one is to uh, sustain in being any, uh, any wholesome qualities that have, uh, that have already arisen, so to, uh, to maintain in being. So there's a lot of doing there. So right effort involves a lot of work. It's, uh, it's Steering the mind, you're recognizing the, the, the unwholesome, letting it go, recognizing the wholesome and uh, feeding it, maintaining it, keeping it in being. So there's work going on. You know, the Eightfold Path is, is a path of action, is a, 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 a whole a comprehensive aspect of, of doing. So that when um, we are say, working with the mind in a, uh, in a way that's based on right effort, we can still be working really hard. Uh, we can be putting forth a, a great deal of energy and effort. But because of uh, the, uh, that effort being free of self-view, because it's not based on craving, uh, then even if there's a, 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 a large amount of effort being expended, uh, it's not stressful. There's not that, oh, well, I'll really be glad when I don't have to bother to do this anymore. Won't it be nice when I don't have to bother? Yeah. Uh, but rather, there's a, a, a joyfulness, actually, and an ease that's there, a kind of comfort that's there, while the effort is being extend, uh, expended. So that uh, um, we, uh, as a culture, we, we, are, we have a very strong impulse, like the thank God it's Friday uh, mentality. There's that, wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have to bother? I'll be, I wouldn't be great to be an Arahant, then I wouldn't have to bother to practice. <laughs> That, that uh, I would say as a, a misunderstanding of what enlightenment is, but it's based on that same kind of, of self-view. But if you look at the life of the Buddha as an example, he worked really hard. You know, he, uh, after his enlightenment, he didn't say, he didn't just sort of sit under the Bodhi tree and say, "Oh, well, thank goodness, all that's over." <laughs> he didn't think about it for a, for a, about a, uh, seven weeks. He sat under these different trees and was contemplating his enlightenment, and then. It, well, you know, there was the thought that passed through his mind, no one's ever going to understand this. It's, it's, it's going to be impossible for me to explain this to anybody, so there, there really isn't any point in me trying to, to uh, convey this to anyone. So that thought did cross his mind. But then uh, the Brahma god Sahampati appeared and said, please, for the benefit of those with a little bit of dust in their eyes, please you know, share the understanding that you have. And so uh, uh, the Buddha so he listened to that and then cast his vision around the world and said, well, yeah, this Sampati is, uh, is absolutely right. There are beings who are really lost and, and, and caught up in greed, hatred and delusion, but there are some who are not so caught up. They just have a little bit of dust in their eyes. Okay, for the sake of them, I'll make the effort to teach. So then for the next 45 years, he worked really hard and incredibly effectively. 2,500 years have gone by since then. I'd like to point out, when the Buddha was teaching... This was the, it was the Iron Age. It wasn't even the late Iron Age, it was the, the early to middle Iron Age in this country. Iron was a new thing in this country when the Buddha was teaching. It was 450 years before the Romans arrived. It was a long time ago. So it's incredible 
that we are the inheritors, uh, all these centuries later, of these words that the, the Buddha spoke and that have come down through the centuries to us and are still very, very effective. So it's kind of miraculous that uh, the teachings have, uh, have sort of sustained themselves in this form. And the reason why they did is because the Buddha worked really, really hard. <laughs> he was incredibly imaginative and inventive in his, his teaching. He was um, uh, very proactive in, in walking all over northeast India and uh, giving instruction to all kinds of people, from you know, farmers and you know, local villagers and uh, um, government ministers and royals and uh, to the Brahmin priests and the merchants and you know, anybody and everybody. So the Buddha worked really hard, but none of that work was stressful. So that uh, uh, I mean, uh, maybe it's not a very good idea to compare ourselves to the Buddha. <laughs> But uh, I, I think it's, it is helpful in a way to have that as an example that it's not the work, it's not the doing that is the burden. It's the attitude towards it. You know, that's what the, 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 the different ingredient is. So when we learn to, um, uh, to uh, work from a, a, a heart of mindfulness and wisdom, then we realize that uh, the, the dilemma that of should I just uh, work uh, uh, against the way things are, to contend against the way things are, try to make it go my way, or whether I should just sort of switch off and, and not feel and try to disconnect. Yeah, both of those are wrong because the, the way of peace is not a way of disengagement, but rather a way of total attunement, an attunement of this life to all life, the attunement of this mind to, to all minds, and then letting that attunement guide action and speech. And uh, you know, any of you who've looked at the scriptures at all or, or studied the life of the Buddha, it is staggering how uh, imaginative he was and what a creative thinker. And the kind of similes he came up with and the stories, the, the illustrations and the examples that he just sort of spontaneously would, uh, would come up with. Like there's the suttas where he's talking to a farmer and he, he talks about you know, the 11 things you need to do to look after cows successfully. And then he, he just, just kind of, apparently off the cuff, he talks about looking after cows and how he, as a warrior noble prince, knew so much about animal husbandry, I do not know. But he immediately comes up with the 11 things you need to do to look after cows to help them flourish and, and uh, do well, and then compares that to 11 things you need to do to look after your mind. And uh, he could just do that uh, with anybody that he was talking to. So... Uh, what this means, or this points to it in a, in a way that's helpful for us, is that uh, when we are able to find that uh, middle way, then it's, uh, it's not only very restful and peaceful, but it's also very productive. It means that we are able to use the capacities, you know, the, the abilities that we have to, the, to the, the fullest extent. We can use our imagination, our capacities, and uh, be helpful. But also, because um, uh, it's a middle way, what, uh, what we find is that if there's a need for us to engage and to use our imagination, our energy, and our, our capacity, we do. But we don't have to do that in order to feel a sense of value. Now, uh, probably a few of us here get, uh, uh, have, in your life, felt a lot of, um, say, affirmation or a sense of self-worth through all the good stuff that you do. Helping a lot of people, having an occupation, I mean, being a doctor or a teacher or a parent. You know, that you feel a lot of gratification because of all the work that you've done and you think of that and think, oh, I've been able to help so many people and I started this school and I, I you know, ran that, that clinic and I uh, published these particular these books or I, I brought my children up in a, in a good way. And, and a feeling of... of pride or gladness uh, and satisfaction of having done all that stuff. But then, if you find that you're uh, grasping that, or that, the, the, that those kind of, sort of good achievements are taken on with self-view, then they become a source of suffering. Because when your, your child says to you, well, thanks very much, but no thanks. <laughs> but, uh, or that... Um, you are um, the people, you founded this clinic and then the, the other members of the, the board of directors say, well, thank you very much, you're our founder, now please 
off you go. You know, we'll, we'll run the place much more efficiently without you, thank you. And you haven't got those, uh, that, those kind of um, sources of, of feedback or affirmation, then we can feel useless. We can feel that our, our life is worthless. I'm not doing anything. I'm not worth anything. Or, or maybe some of you say, I've never run a school, I've never, I've never been a doctor, I've never been a teacher. You know, my life has been worthless already. <laughs> So that uh, we can um, be so feeding our sense of identity, the feeding self-view from those, in a, in, a, in a sense, those wholesome objects, and then not realizing, just like a heroin addict or an alcoholic, that as long as the supply of drug is of choice is is uh, available, we feel good, we feel great. Like um, you know, if you're an extremely rich rock star, you can get a really good supply of totally pure morphine. <laughs> Your medical grade morphine, and your, your uh, morphine habit is not a problem because you've got a good supply. But when the supply cuts off, then there's untold misery. So similarly, if your sense of being, your sense of worth, is fed by having successful children, or by having so, many, uh, so much sort of social approval, so many people liking you on Facebook, or following you on Instagram, Kind of uh, how many people are, you know, nowadays if you publish an academic paper, you can tell how many people have been reading your paper. You can look at your scores. And then uh, if, we are, if we are wise, then we'll recognize those kind of addictions, those kind of dependencies. And that we are, uh, will find that we are able to free the heart from that. So whether there is affirmation or not, whether there's something to do or nothing to do. Uh, we are, uh, our heart is, is equally at ease, is equally free, so that uh, we don't depend upon uh, uh, some kind of doing in order to feel a sense of, of worth. Now, I feel this is very, very important. Uh, and, you know, I'm a kind of an achiever type myself. <laughs> so I'm speaking from experience, you know, and I do like approval. I admit. <laughs> I, I like success, I like approval, and such like. But one of the things that you find is, is most valuable is to, to uh, not be dependent on that. To just do what you do and let the world make of it what it will. To whether people uh, praise you or they don't, or they ignore you or they criticize you. Uh, you can be uh, at ease. You don't have to be doing something in order to be of, of value. There's a, um, uh, in the C.S. Lewis's book, uh, The Screwtape Letters, which some of you might be familiar with. There's a Buddhist version called Letters from Mara, which uh, Ajahn Kulanamo wrote, which is uh, highly recommended. But in the, in the Screwtape Letters, it's sort of uh, the imaginary letters from a, a, a devil to his, uh, his nephew, who's at work in the world. And the nephew's letters back to his uncle about uh, his successes and failures in trying to uh, confuse humanity and cause trouble in the world. So C.S. Lewis was quite a, a uh, well-known, well-loved, uh, Christian theologian, as well as being uh, the writer of the Narnia book, uh, Chronicles. But um, anyway, in the Screwtape Letters, there's this particular comment that really struck me when I was reading it, where uh, <coughs> he, uh, the writer of the letters is, is talking about this particular person that they, they've met, and she said that uh, she is one who is, uh, who is uh, fully given to the, uh, um, uh, in her commitment to helping others, and the others have about them the look of the hunted. <laughs> the others have about them the look of the hunted. This, you know, they, uh, again, I'm not labeling it on, or, or kind of trying to make anyone feel embarrassed. I'm not, I can't read anybody's minds, or I don't read your... I don't, I don't go on Facebook, so I don't know your social profiles. I don't know if there are any uh, uh, hi hyperactive good works types here. They, I'm, I'm sure there will be. But, you know, does your doing of good things, uh, it just, uh, is, that, is that something that you have to do in order to feel good? Is that something that your, your heart's uh, delight depends upon? That, uh, as in, in that, I mean, it's a kind of a, a cruel comment, but it's also, I feel, very astute that, oh, oh look, someone I can help, yes! You know? <laughs> and that moment, You've actually lost contact with that person. You don't really see it. You don't see them. It's like, you know, oh look, it's the Sunday afternoon number talk crowd with them. <laughs> You're my audience. If I'm thinking like that, then I've lost you. 
Uh, I'm not, I'm not, there's no connection uh, between us because you are something that I need in order for me to be in the role of Dhamma teacher. You know, that, uh, that if that's something that I need and that uh, and I feel uh, depleted or, or, or uh, incomplete or, <coughs> or without value, if I haven't got that, then there's a dependency that we've built up in ourselves. So the, the, uh, the, one of the things that uh, was really impressive about uh, Ajahn Chah when I first went to Thailand, I couldn't speak, I couldn't speak or understand Thai at all, you know, not a word. Um, but just watching the, the, the dynamic or the exchange between uh, him and uh, teaching a group of people, or receiving visitors and so forth, one of the things that's... I, mean, I lived at Wat Pananasha, the international monastery that's about uh, five... Uh, five or six miles away from, from the main monastery. But when Ajahn Chah came to visit us, or we go over to visit the main monastery, watching him in action, one of the uh, most uh, powerful things was is that you know, he's very, he was very uh, you know, wise and, and could ver be very uh, charming and engaging, but uh, it was this really distinct feeling of he doesn't need anybody to love him. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> he doesn't need to have everybody's approval. I mean, somebody would say something that was particularly kind of flattering, or um, or sort of, uh, or kind of la you know, laughing extra sort of uh, self-consciously at one of uh, Ajahn Chah's jokes. Yeah, he would this kind of like stone cold look <laughs> could kind of pass across his face, like yeah, really. <laughs> and uh, he didn't need to to feed on that. He didn't need to be approved or loved. He was there to serve. To, to, uh, to embody the Dharma, to, to teach the Dharma. He didn't, he didn't need to be praised or, or liked or approved. Uh, and uh, it was uh, amazing to me to see that. Someone who was so independent, you know, he, was, he, he wasn't cold, uh, but uh, he didn't, he wouldn't feed that sense of, oh, look, you're so wise, you're so wonderful, you're so great, you're the best teacher in the world. Yeah, he would, he had a whole, catalog of ways he would brush off those kind of comments. You know, some kind of uh, uh, northeast Thai wisecrack, you know, or, or some kind of... They have this wonderful... Uh, part of the local dialect is this sort of um, grunt from the hara, which is... <coughs> which can mean yes or no, or are you kidding? <laughs> or like, oh, really? It can mean anything of, of, of that, uh, that range. But uh, it was a, a, a kind of um, independence that he manifested, I felt it was really, in terms of the middle way, which was in the middle way and my way, is that that, uh, that quality of being totally ready to engage and to attune to a situation, but not needing anything from it. That he didn't need people to be any way for him. You know, someone could, uh, could do something, and it was you know, very sort of impressive or inspiring, and, you know, and he would feel gladdened by that. But he wouldn't say, oh, you know, oh, you know, well done, well done, you're the best moment you've ever had. <laughs> he would, uh, you know, he would choose a moment to to uh, to say, you know, someone near a needle rock, he's the one to follow. Yeah, <laughs> at a, an appropriate moment, or or, or he'd say, um, he's not the one to follow. <laughs> Or oh, if uh, someone did something that was completely, uh, completely outrageous or, 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 or totally, totally foolish, uh, again, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't just sort of react blindly, but he would sort of take it in and uh, then at an appropriate moment he'd say, um, did you, what did you really mean when you said that? Because uh, uh, it, it's, uh, to me it sounded pretty crazy. So uh, what, what was behind that? So that uh, he was not one who... Um, made rash judgments, he, he uh, in a sense left space around the people that he met. He didn't need people to be a particular way. He didn't need them to be understanding what he said. He didn't need them to be approving what he said. But he relied uh, completely on a sense of, of openness and attunement to the time, the place, the situation. And that uh, I feel that uh, when we are considering these, the, these areas of how to work uh, in the world, you know, to work uh, from the basis of right effort and, uh, and uh, freedom from self-view, 
that the, the, the essential quality is sort of letting go of self-centered thinking and that openness and attunement of who's here, what's going on? Is there something to say? Is there nothing to say? Don't, don't feel as though just because you're here you've got to do something. <laughs> so in terms of Hamlet's dilemma, it's not a matter of doing or not doing. If the heart is really embodying the middle way, then when it's time to do, you'll do. When it's time to take action, to take arms against the sea of troubles, you will. When it's time to be quiet and to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, you will. When it's time to be quiet, you're totally uh, at home and at ease with being quiet. And when it's time to say something, you'll, you'll say something. You don't need people to, uh, to approve of what you say. You don't need to uh, feel that you're lacking anything if you're keeping quiet. But uh, it's a, a, a essentially uh, a responsivity to the time, the place, the situation. And so that when our, um, uh, our actions, our, our attitudes are, are guided in this way, then we can really be of most benefit to ourselves, to others, and uh, the, the work that we do, some people will like it and will approve, and other people will, uh, not even, will dislike it and disapprove, and a lot will not even notice. <laughs> And then, but our happiness is not dependent upon being liked or not liked or, or being noticed, but uh, over and over again, uh, trusting in that quality of attunement. And, uh, uh, and then the, the last aspect, the, the vimansa, the reviewing, is having acted in that way, you know, functioning in that way, what's the result? If this is the way that we operate, we let go of self-view, we attune ourselves to the time, the place, the situation, What's the result of that? A, um, uh, a, a final story I'll tell, I've told quite a few times before, but it's a, it's a, a useful story. It actually occurred, the exchange occurred right here in the Sala Ramaravati. So again, I was, uh, going back to my own story a little bit, so I was kind of obsessed with being approved of and pleasing everybody all the time. So uh, I was a kind of compulsive good guy. You know, my door was always open, uh, you know, I was always available, I would always volunteer for everything. When it was uh, time to do the washing up, I'd always be first one to the tubs and the last one to finish. I would, you know, clean, not only clean the sinks, I'd clean the rubbish bins. And so I was a kind of obsessive do-gooder. And, uh, and I really liked all the praise that I got from doing that. But then I began to notice I was, uh, I was really stuck on being approved of and being liked and being the, the, the good guy and being the helpful guy. So I decided to consciously work on this. So I deliberately stopped being helpful. I wasn't. I didn't start fights. And I deliberately uh, left things uncleaned. Uh, I would, you know, when the, the washing up, the minimum was, was done, I'd walk off. Or there was rubbish on the ground, I wouldn't pick it up. Or there was, uh, I'd walk into the bathroom and the sinks were all dirty, and I'd leave them dirty and walk out again. So uh, that took a lot of effort. I could feel this. Uh, reaching for that thrown away tissue that shouldn't be there. But, uh, I trained myself to walk past it and, and also not be seeking approval. And uh, So I was doing this for a couple of years and then this, uh, my, when my fellow monk's here, uh, uh, he doesn't live here anymore, but uh, he just, if, without trying to be uh, uh, pointed or accusing anyway, it was quite a sincere, friendly remark. He said, you know, you're a lot easier to live with since you stopped trying to be perfect. <laughs> So I wasn't quite sure whether to be insulted or, or, or flattered, but, uh, uh, but it, was a, it was a very, very useful comment that me trying to please everyone and be perfect, like the, 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 the do-gooder, you know, hunting the people for help, you know, that uh, there was a kind of tension that was being carried around, a, a stressing, and that when you just sort of stop acting in a compulsive way, or you're not uh, depending on that kind of doingness and, and approval, just to learn to leave things alone. When it's time to leave things alone, let somebody else do it. Then, and there's to operate from, from more of an intuitive uh, sense of the moment, then there's a peacefulness. And it was really striking that that was more, in, more pleasant to live with than me being the would-be perfect monk. So after these thoughts for reflection this afternoon, mm -hmm. we can have a cup of tea now and uh, resume for our Dhamma discussion at uh, 20 past.
So I would ask uh, if people have questions to wait till the microphone arrives so that then we, uh, everyone can hear the questions and then they can be uh, uh, properly recorded as well. So, for question number one. You talked about attunement, a place of attunement. Can you describe how that feels? Like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's like if you're listening to a, uh, an orchestra and you are aware that the, um, the orchestra, uh, all the different elements of the orchestra, playing in tune and in rhythm with each other, that's the feeling. So it's not complicated. It's not, it's not anything particularly refined. It's uh, the heart's own recognition of, of, order, of orderliness or harmony. It doesn't mean, I mean, it also appreciates that some, some music is deliberately chaotic. <laughs> but uh, it's a, that sense of presence <coughs> and um, openness, uh, a, uh, a setting aside of uh, prejudice, so that there, there's a, like a, a full <coughs> listen. Um, and in a, a part of it, then, on where meditation comes in, is um, to the degree as possible, suspending the inner commentary or not letting the inner commentary dominate the picture. But uh, just to be able to uh, you know, open the, the heart, open the mind to the, the present experience. And not uh, and, and in a way, it's to do with the theme that I was talking about today, that uh, not being pulled, not letting the heart be pulled by the sense of I've got to do something with this. This is the perfect sunset. I'm going to keep it or tell someone or take a picture or something. But uh, uh, that kind of compulsiveness can be let go of and the heart can just sort of <coughs> attune itself to what's there. Even attuning itself to, oh, here's that compulsive feeling, like I've got to do something. Oh, it's this. <laughs> so that even your, your own waves of attitude become part of what's, uh, what's being seen. But you can still act. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's one of the things, it's kind of um, being open to the way things are is not a passivity. And this is one of the things that, that so uh, Lumpur Samedi would often use the phrases like, this is the way it is, or you know, the, uh, this is the way things are, or it, it's, it's this way. Uh, one of his great phrases was, it's never been more like this than it is. <laughs> deserves to get my t-shirt, I think. <laughs> but, uh, so then often people would hear that and say, and there's even a book of his called This Is The Way It Is. And then that's interpreted as a kind of passivity. Then, and so the mind immediately says, well, therefore, don't do anything. Therefore, unplug or leave it alone. Um, and so uh, over the years he had to uh, and others, others of us, you know, when addressing the same kind of teachings or expressions, you have to point out that your intentionality, your ability to act, is also part of the way things are. So that being at peace with how it is, is also being at peace with your capacity to act. So sometimes um, that sense of it's this way can be one of the way, the way it is, is someone's doing something really harmful, now is the time to step in and say no. So it's not a passivity, but rather it can be letting go of your hesitation, letting go of your reticence to, to, to do something or to engage. And so that it's the opposite of passivity. It's kind of, in a sense, you're letting go of your own uh, anxiety or your, uh, the internal chatter that says, should I, should not, should I, shouldn't I? But uh, that attunement, or that period, this is the way it is, then your ability to jump in and say no, that, uh, that, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a good thing to do. 
So that there's a um, uh, a kind of um, in a way, it's just letting go of an idealistic, an idealized picture of I should be. Because we, we, we create like a, an idealized picture in our minds, like it should be this world, you know, this is how I should be. And then we try to become that idealized picture. So that's explaining the world. And it's a bit like driving the car from the back seat. You're, you're not really engaged with the controls. Yeah, it doesn't really work. Um, and so that ideals have a value, like the, the Buddha image is an ideal. But that, that Buddha image has, has been around for a couple of hundred years, and it, he's never had to move. That, that Buddha image does not experience knee pain. It doesn't have to eat or breathe. Whereas if you're a living being, uh, we're not an ideal. We have to, to, to breathe and eat and move. And so the, um, uh, if we put how I should be, or the perfect me would be like this, if we put that at the center and then have well, the way I am sort of faint but pursuing and off of the edges. Then we've got things the wrong way around without trying to drive the car from the back seat. So you, you use an ideal, but you have the ideal in the back seat. You know, okay, that, uh, this is a, a, a person who was free of greed, hatred, and delusion, uh, probably wouldn't have this experience or this attitude. But right now there is this, this feeling of being uh, excited because of being praised or, or hurt because of being criticized. You know being jealous of someone or, or um, you know, afraid of someone. And so that the, um, that readiness to be aware and to be attuned to what, what's here. Uh, and then also being ready to, to, uh, to listen to, well, um, you know, you're feeling afraid because it's really dangerous. Get out of the road. <laughs> this is appropriate fear. This isn't, you know, this isn't being neurotic. Get out of the road. To get, to get to a safe place. So that uh, our ability to act is part of the way things are. And so that then this quality of attunement, as I like to call it, uh, is in a, freeing up that, that capacity to act. So when it's time to speak, then you speak. When it's time to be quiet, you can be quiet. Because we, we can, there's a, a story from the Indian folk legends, the uh, Panchatantra, of a, of a snake, a cobra that became a disciple of a, a guru living in the forest, this, this yogi living in the forest. And this snake, because Cobra used to go on her hunting rounds through the, through the forest. And, and she noticed whenever she, she came through this glade where, the, where the, the rishi was living, so this very kind of delightful feeling would come over her. So she'd slow down, spend a bit longer, and sit around by the rishi, and the rishi was sort of talking to, to his disciples. And So she stayed there longer and longer, and started to listen to what the, the rishi was, was saying. And, Eventually, he thought, well, this, this human really says some good stuff, and there's a really nice feeling, so maybe I should become a disciple as well. So then uh, she's, she, she goes to the Rishi, and of course, Indian folk tales, snakes, snakes can talk to people very easily. <laughs> and, uh, so the, uh, so the, the cobra says, uh, well, uh, uh, Rishi, uh, would you accept me as your disciple? Because uh, I, I feel that you've got a lot of very uh, wonderful things to say, and I really like being around you. And he said, well, you know, I teach non-violence, and you know, we're, we're a strictly vegetarian outfit here. <laughs> so if you're a cobra, there could be some problems. You know, you know, I, I appreciate your faith and your interest, but you know, you have to be realistic. And the cobra said, no, no, I think I, think I can do it, I think I can do it. You know, I, I, really, I really trust you, I admire you, I, I love what, what, what you do and how you are, so I'll, I'll only give it a try. So the cobra goes on to a vegetarian diet. <laughs> And, uh, and then tr tries to um, act in a peaceful way. And then uh, one day she's sort of curled up in the sunshine on a rock and some lads from the local village uh, come along and, and, and see that uh, her, her tail sticking out so they tweak the cobra's tail and see if they can run away. And as they run away, they see that she hasn't reacted. She's sort of, sort of coiled up there. So they kind of laugh at her and, and run off. So then uh, and a few days later, then they find her again. And, pull her tail a bit harder and, <clears throat> and, uh, and run off and she's <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and then the, the third day this happens then they think well this is a really stupid cobra you know this, this is a real, a real, uh, a real uh, you know, 
failure as a cobra, you know, you can, you can tease this one as much as you like and you don't get a reaction. And so then they pick her up by the tail, whirl her around and throw her up into the trees. So then the cobra kind of makes her way to the, to the rishi and says, Guruji, I think we've got a problem. <laughs> because they've got you know, a broken fang and kind of scales knocked sideways. Uh, uh, we've got a problem because, you know, I'm really, I'm doing this non-violence thing really seriously. But, you know, those lads from the village, they're really, uh, they're really trying my patience. And, you know, I, I, I'm taking this to teaching seriously and I'm, I'm determined, you know, not to, not to kill. But, you know, these, these boys are really uh, testing my patience. And they try this one more time. I'm, I can't be sure I'm going to be able to control my actions. And then... Uh, the, the Rishi says, well, uh, dear Cobra, I think you know, you're doing a fantastic job. You know, you're really admirable in your faith and your commitment. And uh, you know, for a Cobra to take on this standards of non-violence, this is amazing. You know, you're a really good example. But you know, it's also, um, uh, you know, when, when you take on a standard of, of non-violence, uh, and it's really important that, that, uh, the, um, that you take that seriously and that you refrain from killing these uh, these young lads, but I never said that you couldn't hiss. <laughs> so appropriate hissing can be uh, applied at times when the, the moment demands it. <laughs> so, any other questions? But I heard, heard this uh, uh, rather controversial thing from Mark recently about the path. Uh, he said the progression of the path is not as Siva uh, Samadhi Pradhyaya, but as Pradhyaya Pradhyaya Siva Samadhi. The Samadhi was at the beginning of it. Uh, would you be able to kindly uh, express some thoughts on that? Because it's not what I've learned and I've always uh, listen, I mean, heard it as Siddha Samad Pratna, the, mm -hmm. the progression of the path. But uh, this controversial thing is kind of, I mean, it's puzzling me uh, how it can be, and I don't want to accept it either, I mean, without good reason. Could you kindly explain? Well, I wouldn't say it's particularly controversial. I mean, the Eightfold Path begins with right view and right intention. So it starts with the Panya factors. The Eightfold Path, Samadhiti, Samasankapo, Samar, those are the first two. Those are the Panya, those are the wisdom factors. So it's not really controversial, it's what the Buddha first said in his, in the, his first teaching. <laughs> so it's not controversial. Um, it, it's a, in, in a way, it's an example of the Buddha giving um, related teachings in slightly different formats. You know, so that um, in some teachings, he talks about um, Say, for example, there's a, 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 a teaching that's known as the um, Upanissa Sutta, that liberation is a natural process. And he says, uh, for one who, is, who keeps the moral precepts, who keeps sila, there's no need for them to, to think, may my heart be free from remorse, because it's natural for one who keeps the sila for their heart to be free from remorse. For one whose heart is free from remorse, there's no need for them to think, may my body and mind be relaxed, because it's natural for one who's free from remorse to be, feel relaxed in body and mind. One who's relaxed in body and mind, there's no need for them to, to wish, uh, may I feel uh, contented, because one who's relaxed in body and mind will feel contentment. For one who's contented, uh, there's no need for them to think, may, uh, may I concentrate my mind easily, because for one who is uh, uh, relaxed and contented, it's easy for them to concentrate their minds. For one who's whose mind is concentrated, then there's no need for them to, to wish, um, may a knowledge and vision of the way things are arise, because one whose mind is concentrated, uh, knowledge and vision of the way things are naturally arises. One who's in whom there is knowledge and vision of the way things are, there's no need for them to, to think, may I become dispassionate and detached, because the one who sees things the way they are, their heart becomes dispassionate and detached. And one who's, who's dispassionate and detached, there's no need for them to, to think, may my heart be liberated, because the one who, who experiences dispassion and detachment, um, then it's natural for the heart to be liberated. So in that succession, from, he goes from Sila, all the way through uh, samadhi and then vanya and liberation. So uh, that in that expression, which the Buddha uses quite often, that kind of thing, uh, sila samadhi vanya, very clear. 
But in the Eightfold Path, Samaditi, right view, Samasankapo, you know, right resolution, right intention, those are the two Panya factors. Those are the two wisdom factors. Then you get Samavacha, right speech, Samakamanto, right action, Samavajivo, right, right livelihood, which are the, the, um, uh, the Sila factors. Uh, and then you get right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, Samavayama, that I talked about earlier, and Sama Sati, right mindfulness, right concentration. Then you know, get the, the Samadhi factors at last. So in the Eightfold Path, as the Buddha describes it, numerous, numerous times, it's Panya, Sila, Samadhi. So I would say it's not controversial at all. <laughs> anyway, it's more controversial to say it's Sila, Samadhi, Panya. <laughs> but uh, there's all sorts of different ways that it's explained. Um, and that uh, one of the explanations or the, the ways of understanding it is what they call the kind of two, uh, two turnings of the, of the wheel. And so that the, uh, an intellectual appreciation of the wisdom factors, you know, right view as, uh, as kind of concepts, so that right view as in understanding cause and effect, uh, right view as, uh, uh, as a, um, seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths as a concept, you know, like as a, so it's like the, the setup of things on, a, on a, a mundane level. So it's sort of the, the idea, the right ideas in a way. And then uh, Sama Sankapa, Sankapa is like resolution or intention, and that's the intention towards harmlessness, the intention towards loving kindness, the intention towards virtue. So that uh, in that sort of first turning of the wheel, it's sort of setting up the conceptual framework. And then taking the precepts as um, uh, as kind of uh, yeah, the kind of standards, as sort of agreed behaviours, and then uh, the training of concentration uh, of the mind. So the, the first turning of the of the wheel is all in, in terms of like a, a mundane appreciation of the eightfold path, and then the second turning is then uh, the so then you have the samadhi leading into the panya sort of. You know, the samadhi of the first lot leading into the panya of the second round. And that's, okay, when the mind is, uh, um, uh, is, uh, is established in, in concentration, then that helps genuine wisdom to arise. So not just the ideas of what right view is, but in actually changing one's vision to you know, seeing with insight, seeing with true panya. So you see the difference that between the in the first round is just the concept or the, the, or the kind of external structures, like the precepts as Panati Bhata, Viramani, Adinadana, Viramani, and so on. Then the second turning is the actual quality of wisdom, and then that feeding into a, an actual quality of virtue. So not just the precepts as the rules that you do and you don't do, but the actual gunadhamma, the, the uh, quality of virtue, which is the felt experience of, of, of virtue. You know, the attitudes of non-violence, not just, I'm keeping a rule that says don't kill anything, but that uh, the, the activity of the heart that is incapable of violence is, is uh, developed. And then that leads to the concentration, to, to the samadhi factors, where that, um, the development of concentration, like I was saying earlier today, it's, it's concentration, but it's imbued with wisdom, it's imbued with right views. So it's not me practicing to get jhana, or me trying to become enlightened, but it's uh, the development of the, of the, um, uh, the samadhi factors, but without being corrupted by self-view and uh, uh, the kind of, um, the, you know, mundane, without just having the, the mundane aspect of it. So there's various teachings of the Buddha that, that talk about the path in that, uh, that way there's a mundane path and the super mundane path. So that it's, <coughs> there's, uh, that's another way of, of regarding it. So, but I wouldn't, you know, if someone's saying that's a controversial teaching to talk about Panya first, uh, I would say that's not really the case. There's also a very famous uh, Dhamma talk by Ajahn Mahabua um, called uh, Wis Wisdom Conditions of Samadhi which uh, he gave back in the 1960s. I think it was the first thing of his that was ever put into English. Um, uh, and uh, Wisdom Conditions Samadhi. And it talks about the, um, in a way, the application, how, how wisdom supports the development of Samadhi. And uh, that was a uh, you know, very, very influential teaching. Actually, the, the Christian monk, Thomas Merton, uh, referred to that as a spiritual masterpiece. 
uh, that wisdom conditions and samadhi that uh, Dhamma talk. So that um, I would say that uh, it's, you know, these are all sort of interrelated qualities and that uh, you know, people can put things across in a, in a particularly uh, dogmatic way because that's how they've been taught. Or they've said, what well, he says in the Vasudhi Manga, this is correct and you know, the other interpretations are all wrong. Or, or this is what it says. And, but it's like there's, a, there's a, maybe the last thing to say on it where you get into these contentious uh, situations is um, there's a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya called the Bahu Vilaniya Sutta. The many kinds of feeling, Bahu means many, ve, uh, Vedana, like feeling. So the uh, Bahu Vedaniya Sutta, the many kinds of feeling. And it starts off with two of the disciples of the Buddha arguing, two lay, two lay disciples of the Buddha. And one says, the Buddha says there's two kinds of feeling, pleasant, pain, pleasant feeling and painful feeling. And the other one says, no, I've heard him say there's three kinds of feeling, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neutral feeling. No, 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 I've heard it myself, I've heard it myself, there's two kinds of feeling, pleasant feeling, painful feeling. No, well, I've heard him as well. He said, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neutral feeling. And they're kind of going at it, you know, arguing with each other, and each one determined that, you know, they're right. So eventually they decide, let's go and ask the Master, since they were, <coughs> the Buddha was alive and they were, in, they were nearby, so they were wise enough to go and ask the Buddha. And the Buddha then gives this wonderful discourse saying, yes, at certain times I've talked about two kinds of feeling, other times I've talked about three kinds of feeling, other times I've talked about six kinds of feeling, other times I've talked about 18 kinds of feeling, other times I've talked about 36 types of feeling, other times I've talked about 108 types of feeling. You know, and he kind of <laughs> basically creams them. <laughs> You know, that, uh, that uh, I talk about things in different ways at different times. So that um, the most important thing is that you guys are arguing with each other. <laughs> That's what you should be noticing. <laughs> and that uh, you're both right. But you should uh, see how your minds are dwelling on the, the kind of uh, the conflict and wanting to, to be right. And that that's, uh, that's what's significant. So in terms of... of um, spiritual <coughs> practice and what's useful um, it's very really useful to recognize that you can be right in fact but wrong in Dhamma you know, even if you got you can quote the passage, you've got the authorities you've got recordings, you've got everything that will back you up, but you're using that to beat somebody over the head with your rightness that means you're wrong because <laughs> you might have your facts correct but the whole way that you're relating is completely out of tune with Dhamma. You're using the Dhamma as a club, which is not the appropriate use. Any other questions? This is a hand there. It's a gentleman in the blue shirt. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I found the talk very pertinent to what's actually going on with me at the moment. Um, I'm starting a new venture, a new social venture, and there are many, many opportunities for me to sort of do things my way and to, <laughs> and to get it all completely wrong. And I could, I could just see hundreds of pitfalls opening up in front of me, and I'd rather not fall into them if possible. Um, I'm, so I'm starting a social venture um, and it really needs a bit of change of mind on some people. It needs what? It needs a change of, of mind, mm -hmm. a change of approach from people generally because the things are just not working at the moment and I think that's accepted. But I have to help bring about this change of mood and I need people working with me on it and I can see that if people don't come with me, I'm going to feel very upset or something. I think, is it, am I blocking it or are they just no good? And if I do get people with me, I can see lots of, if I do have a team, some things that will be easy to do with the team, and some things I want to do my way. And I can just see that the way I'm looking at it at the moment, I don't have a peaceful path through it. Mm. Um, so I'd um, like a bit of help. Because what you're, I think you, I actually heard what you're talking about in the talk, and you seem to talk about so much of this, but it's all whizzing around in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's all been recorded and filmed yeah. and two different cameras, so yeah. there are lots of different angles on it. Yeah. Well, um, like, like I was saying um, in the talk, 
And for myself, I was a very ambitious and, and success-oriented person. And so I've reflected on this a lot, this area. And, um, and you know, I'm a sort of professional contemplative, so the main thing I'm supposed to be studying is my mind. <laughs> so I, I, I saw that uh, within me and also saw the kind of stressing, tension that, that that creates within one. Always wanting success and afraid of failure, wanting approval, fear, fear of disapproval. Um, and uh, again, it was here in this, this very hall at Amravati. Uh, the, the routine used to be every morning, uh, Lumpur Sumedho would, uh, we'd gather at breakfast time, the whole community together, and, and he would give like a half hour, 45 minute long Dharma reflection every morning. And then after he'd finished, then we would sort of sort out the business of the day and organize the different things that were happening in the monastery. So I was, a, for a long time, I was like the monastery secretary and sort of one of the organizing people here. And so, I, and I noticed that uh, if, while he was talking or he was sort of engaging with the Sangha or an announcement was being made, if I said something, I made some kind of wise crack, then everyone would go, <laughs> you know, and I would get this sort of cat that got the cream feeling. Like, you know, I, yeah, I'm a made of funny. Uh, and this is good. <laughs> yeah, it's like a hundred percent satisfaction. It's like a totally good thing. And then, if the opposite happened, and I make some wise crack, and everyone just looks at the carpet, <laughs> and then there will be this broken into a million pieces feeling. And uh, and I saw I saw that that pattern happening, kind of over and over. And um, so I, I decided to really look at it directly and to and contemplate that. And uh, the, um, the upshot was that I, I eventually learned to, to uh, see success and failure in very different ways. Because if you, um, if, if you reflect, you know, you can think of something that you succeeded at, I'd say five years ago, ten years ago, something, you, know, you got a promotion, or you got a book published, or you got a prize, or you, something went, absolutely went your way. And you think, this is so great, I got, you know, got my degree, and I, I, I've got the perfect partner, and finally we, we closed that deal, hooray! And then five years later, you think, I can't believe I was celebrating. You know, that was the worst thing that ever happened to me. But at the time, you were, you were rejoicing. But then five years later, ten years later, it, you realize, oh, how did I not see that coming? And so that success so easily turns into something that's painful. Similarly, at the other end of the scale, we can look back again five or ten years and something at the time was a total disaster. You know, your project has fallen apart, your partner's walked out, you've got some horrible disease. Uh, it's all, uh, it, you know, you've been totally uh, slammed, publicly shamed and whatever. And it's a disaster. But then five years later you realize, well, I never would have chosen that, but damn it, that's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> and meaning it, seeing that it is true. So then what does that say about success and failure? You know, that we when we, we want a particular thing and call it a success, it's an extremely narrow and conditioned view. Also, your success might be painful for somebody else. When you win, everybody else has lost. So how does that feel for the other people who didn't get the prize? <laughs> and uh, you know, what does that do to their relationship with you? <laughs> and you with them and so on. So the, uh, I found that the, the whole way of relating to succeeding and failing I mean, it was a, a lot of work you know, in terms of meditation and reflection and looking at attitudes and emotions um, was, was needed. But the sense of, um, rather than being addicted to success and terrified of failure, to, to take a much more pragmatic sense. Like, so, well, this looks like a good way forward. Yeah, if it works out this way, then I th it seems like it will benefit the company, it will benefit me and, and the people around me. So this looks like a good way forward. Let's see what happens. So again, it's essentially the same as the theme that I was talking about. It's really not tying your ego to the effort, but making the effort. Okay, this looks like a good way forward. I think we've got you know, all the different factors we've taken into account. This, 
you know, the people I'm working with, and the amount of money we've got, and the place where we are, and okay, well let's, let's try this and see what happens. So there's no ego involvement. It's just based on attunement to the time, the place, the situation, the people, the resources. And then, okay, let's see what happens. And then if it succeeds, and sort of it is beneficial, then, oh well, okay, that worked well, okay. I won't assume, you know, happily ever after. <laughs> but, okay, well this, this seems to be going well. This, this uh, tells me to keep going in this direction, but let's not assume that it's always going to be good. Uh, let, let's learn the lessons that we can and keep heading this way, and then if we need to change, we'll change. Similarly, if you take a, a direction and you realize, right, <laughs> this is a complete disaster. Um, okay, so that was a wrong turn. Um, so let's uh, turn back, take a different route, and uh, learn from that, that mistake. And again, because without being an ego involvement, it's much easier to fail. It's like you can say, okay, that was a wrong turn, we missed our turning. Okay, no problem, just turn around and go back. There's a, a Native American proverb that I'm very fond of, and when I was living in the States that I came across, which is, no matter how far you've gone down the wrong track, when you find out, turn around. Because there's this kind of ego investment, well I've gone so far, I can't stop now. It's a sort of, uh, might as well be hanged for a sheep as for a lamb. It's like, well, yes and no. <laughs> we don't have to think that way. And that, uh, and the sort of, well, what will people think of me if I back out now? It's like, well, <laughs> you don't have to be dominated by that. But rather, okay, well, that, um, that really didn't work. So what do we learn from why that didn't work? And... And because it, if there isn't a lot of ego involvement, it's more just being guided by mindfulness and wisdom, then you can actually quite enjoy being wrong. You know, I, I was a co-abba in the California with Ajahn Pasana for about 13, 14 years. And um, he's an extremely practical person. He was very, very handy. He, he grew up in northern Manitoba, so they have chainsaw maintenance is one of the standard high school subjects in the town where he grew up. Even for women, the, the, girl, the girl students said that everyone had a handle chainsaw and used an ice hockey stick. You know? <laughs> so it was you know, a very, very practical, grounded uh, approach to life, where I would tend to be more sort of cerebral and theoretical. And it was uh, developing a Bayagiri monastery together. We had this raw, wild forest in Northern California, building a forest monastery with kutis and water lines and water tanks and springs and whatnot. And uh, over and over again, I would say, I think it would be really good to put a path through this way. Or we put the water tank uh, you know, over there. And uh, we could put the kuti. It's a really nice spot where the kuti's got a good view. And, and he would say, yeah, it's a nice spot, but there's no way you, you can't get a path in there. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a vertical cliff you know, that you can't get around. <laughs> so it might look like a good spot, but you, can't, you couldn't get to and from the kuti if you built it there. Or that, uh, or, or the uh, uh, regularly, I would seem to find a, a perfect place for a kuti that was then uh, above where the water tank was. Water flows downhill. He would frequently point out to me. <laughs> Better to have the, the kuti below where the water tank is, because there wasn't like mains water. It was like on a wild hillside. Yeah, so it's just springs and and, uh, <coughs> and and wells was what we relied on. And so, uh, and then, oh yeah, right, right, water, downhill, yes. <laughs> and I actually, and so uh, from an ego level, it's like, oh, you know, Amro made a stupid you know, suggestion again. But on a, a non-ego level, it's like, oh, great, you know, how wonderful to have this person who knows what they're talking about. <laughs> you know, it saves us a lot of money. <laughs> we don't end up building the kutis and you know, the huts in the wrong place, you know, where they're, where they're not very really going to serve a good purpose. So in terms of developing, I don't know what kind of um, service you're aiming to provide, but on that, ba that basic level, if you, it's a, it's a kind of attitudinal change, like the way you relate to succeeding and failing, and basically putting aside what other people think. Because if we try to act according to what we think will make other people happy, it's always going to be out of tune. It's like, um, trying to play with an orchestra from you know, uh, a, a score with the, you know, the earphones. <laughs> if you can't hear the other instruments, 
you can't possibly play in, in tune and on, on, on beat. It's impossible. No matter how accurately and right you're playing, it's never going to fit with everyone else. You can't. So, that sort of being guided by what other people think, or what you think they think, <laughs> is always going to be, a, like, it's like having the earplugs in, it's always going to be a few steps removed. So, mysteriously, it's when you, um, you, you know, trust your own intuition and then have your idea of what others think. But rather, you just uh, let yourself uh, attune as well as you can to the present situation. S uh, get a sense of what's for the best. Consult with people and say, okay, well, let's, let's try this. Rather than being guided by your fear and supposition. And then uh, my experience is that then you, you find yourself far more uh, relaxed about what you're doing you know, and far more really in tune and ready to adjust than if you're trying to do this goal, well, you know, she thinks like this and he thinks like that and, you know, and, uh, and she always wants it this way and, and he's always been like that. And, you know, you know, you're making kind of assumptions and, and suppositions. And uh, it's not, you're not kind of ignoring everyone, but if, it's, um, if your actions are based more on trying to please others than on listening to your own intuition, it's, it's never going to work. So that, uh, in a sense, uh, like I, I said, I would use this, this little mantra, just do what you do and let the world make of it what it will. Which sounds kind of like a sociopath mantra. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a kind of enlightened soci sociopathic attitude, if you like. Because you're not, you're not shutting everybody out, but in a, in a way you're attuning more completely to the situation because you're not cluttering it up with your projections and your fears and your, uh, your ideology, but you're kind of letting that fall away and then, in a, in a sense, just letting your heart attune to, to what's really here. And, the, and then if you try to shift the attitude in that way, then things that are strong in your mentality, like if you realize, um, actually wanting to be loved by doing something good is a really strong motivation. <laughs> like, oh, so does that mean I should stop doing what I'm doing because I just want people to like me? <laughs> and then you can consider, like, well, yeah, okay, I do really like being loved and approved, but does that mean I should stop doing this good thing because you know, this good thing uh, might really be a benefit, and whether it strokes my ego or not, could be is beside the point. Do you see what I mean? So that uh, a, you know, just because it, something might seem to be feeding a uh, an unskillful habit, I mean, I still like being approved. You know? if, if you'd all sort of got up and walked out <laughs> at the uh, half past two, that would have been a feeling. <laughs> Probably in the, in the region of Pau. <laughs> but um, uh, so, but it, it's a, it's the kind, it's the, the quality of the, uh, uh, of uh, dependency, the kind of way it's held, is the important thing, and that um, you know you can recognise a sense of uh, ambition or, or, or particular things that are particularly sweet to you, and you can know that they're there, but you don't have to let them. You know, have power over your mind would be a particularly strong influence. I often quote this, this statement by Roy Jenkins, who was um, a famous uh, politician, British politician, um, one of the uh, founders of the um, uh, Social Democrat Party back in the day, um, Shirley Williams and others. And uh, <coughs> so, uh, he, and he was a very prominent politician. He was the Home Secretary at one point, I believe. And he was being, he'd, uh, just published a, he was also quite a scholar, he was, I think, the um, Chancellor of Oxford University. And um, he just published a book, so he was being interviewed by The Guardian, or an uh, independent one of those people. And so they asked him, you know, Mr. Jenkins, do you have any regrets about your, your life, anything that you would have liked to achieve that you didn't? And he said, well, as a politician uh, in this country, it's natural, you know, anyone who ever enters into politics you know, has the idea that they'd, they'd like to become Prime Minister one day. 
And so, of course, like everyone else, I had that idea that I, you know, I, my ambition would be to, to be prime minister. Uh, and uh, so, he, uh, and then he kind of paused and said, "So I, so I, I uh, uh, that's how I used to think, but then I realised I didn't actually want to be prime minister. I wanted to have been prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I, I wanted to be prime minister, but not do prime minister." I thought, that's really insightful. <laughs> so he could see that, yeah, there's an ambition, and it's kind of there around the end, but if, if you put that front center, then it, is, it just creates more difficulty and, and disappointment and suffering. But if you recognize, oh, it's, it's just a sort of a little voice off at the edges, and it doesn't really have to be given too much credence or value, <coughs> then it, it can be there. It doesn't have to be... Um, Something to be uh, sort of banished or embarrassed about, you know, it's just, uh, or feel like uh, this is the one great disappointment in my life, my one real failure. But I thought that was a tremendous wisdom on his part to recognise that that he wanted to have been there, just as like was a, you know, a, a, a success point. And so I, I feel that that if we are more aware of those kind of um, sort of ambitions or aspects of self-view about how we want to be or how we want to be seen or what we want to achieve, what we want to do and just kind of deflate them a bit just <laughs> not take them too seriously and just say, you know, in a perfect world I would really like it to be this way but we'll, we'll see how it goes or, yeah, uh, so that then you're not um, and, and it's, it's mysterious how it works because even though it might seem like you're being less ambitious or you're going to try less hard, on the practical level, it actually helps you to do things better. <laughs> it helps you to work in a more effective way because, again, you're not functioning with this sort of uh, idealism cluttering up the picture. You're, you're, you're not um, sort of trying to put this ideal me in, in the sort of front center, but that's sort of staying in the background while you've actually got the, your hands on the wheel and your feet on the pedals. And you're, you're actually driving uh, your life rather than and uh, um, the kind of having an idealized image of you know who and what you are how you should be at the, at the front and center of things. I see the time has gone by four o'clock already just like that. So thank you all for your good attention. Thank you for not all departing. <laughs> you can if you want to. I'm not. Not emotionally dependent. <laughs> Next talk I give, if I get really boring and irritating, then you're totally welcome to leave. It's appropriate. That's enough for today.